Hello, and welcome to Chief Executive Group's presentation of this exclusive webinar, How to Measure the Success of Your Compensation Strategy. My name is Michael Bamberger, and I'll be your host for today's presentation. Chief Executive Group is the publisher of Chief Executive Magazine. We also host live events for CEOs, publish research reports and guides, and provide expert insights through online events like this webinar. If you're not familiar with our events and publications, I invite you to check out our website at chiefexecutive.net to learn more. As part of our research series, we annually publish the CEO and Senior Executive Compensation Report for private companies, the most comprehensive and data-rich benchmarking report of its kind. In order to provide even more insight into executive compensation best practices, we've partnered with compensation experts from the VisionLink Advisory Group, one of the country's leading compensation advisory services firms for private companies. It is my pleasure to introduce your speakers today, Ken Gibson and Joe Miller. Ken Gibson is Senior Vice President and one of the principals of the VisionLink Advisory Group. He has been consulting with middle market, private, and small public companies on executive compensation and benefits issues for over 30 years. During his career, he has spoken to a variety of business groups throughout the country regarding a range of compensation themes. He's authored numerous articles and white papers addressing compensation and rewards issues that modern businesses face. Ken also conducts continuing education credit workshops for CPAs in California, which address a variety of current compensation topics and issues. Similarly, he produces a monthly webinar series that is broadcast to business owners and executives throughout the country. In these broadcasts, Ken and VisionLink CEO Tom Miller make presentations on cutting-edge themes that can help businesses achieve world-class rewards programs. Ken is the past president of the South County chapter of the BYU Management Society, an international organization affiliated with the Marriott School of Management at Brigham Young University. He currently serves on the Global Steering <coughs> Committee for that organization. He is married, has four children and two grandchildren, and resides in Highland, Utah. Joe Miller leads VisionLink's broad-based compensation department. He has over 12 years experience in compensation design and administration. He has worked in compensation leadership roles within several national organizations, in addition to his direct involvement with VisionLink clients. Joe provides clients with insight and direction relating to market pay comparisons, the development of internal pay grade structures, and linking pay decisions to performance. Joe eliminates the confusion and chaos associated with pay management. Before I hand it over to Ken and Joe, I want to make sure you're aware that there will be time for Q&A at the end of this presentation. If you have any questions you'd like Ken or Joe to answer, please enter them in the question box in the GoToWebinar webinar control panel on your screen. We'll try to answer as many as we can during the broadcast, but if we don't get to your question, we'll be providing answers over email. So please feel free to enter any questions you may have throughout the presentations. And now without further ado, I will hand it over to Ken and Joe. Thank you, Michael. This is Ken Gibson, and uh, on behalf of the Vision Link Advisory Group, I want to extend our appreciation first to the Chief Executive for inviting us to make this uh, broadcast presentation today, and then to each of you, of course, for taking time to listen in. Uh, we're going to talk about an important topic today, one that we get questioned about quite a bit as a consulting firm, how to, how to measure the success of your compensation strategy. I think at the end of this meeting today, you will have a better sense for uh, how you should look at um, your approach to compensation, what kinds of programs you put in place, and then how you evaluate whether or not they're being successful. So let's jump right in, and uh, we have a lot of material to cover today. I want to make sure we get through it in a timely fashion, so here we go. Let's, uh, let's set the stage for what we want to talk about today with kind of a common question that we get from potential clients. When, when somebody calls our office or asks to meet with us, and we've kind of talked about what we do and how we do it, very often, uh, in one way or another, the question kind of comes down to this. So, what results have your clients been able to achieve since you've helped them with their compensation programs? So the thought is, if I implement this compensation strategy, I'm going to see a certain increase in something, right? There's going to be something gets better in my business because of these compensation programs. So we, we enjoy that question, and we appreciate it. It's, it's a logical question to ask. What we do say, though, um, is that it, it's the right idea, but it's really the wrong question, and here's why. Let's, get, let's have a scenario here where we say that a company installs a phantom stock pro program, and we'll talk about phantom stock a little bit later in our, our program today, but let's say that somebody wants to instill a long-term uh, incentive program, value-sharing program with some of their key producers in the business, so they decide that the best fit for them is a phantom stock plan. Let's say that over the next uh, 
period of, of, of perhaps three years that, that, that revenues go on to double in that business. So what would we say? Is that success attributable to the phantom stock plan? Or conversely, if revenues had gone down over that period of time, is the phantom stock plan to blame? Well, I think as you start looking at these underlying questions, you start realizing there's only so much of a, a uh, direct link you can create between compensation and what happens long term in the company. So if that's if that's the case, then what do you want to really consider? Well, number one, when you look at the growth factor I just talked about, there could be many issues that impacted whether or not that business had that kind of increase over that time, correct? They may have introduced a new product during that period of time. Maybe they, they had a key acquisition they made. There might have been a competitor that moved out of the marketplace um, during that period of three years that caused a, a sudden surge in their business. They caught some phenomenon in the economy at just the right time, and so on and so forth. There's lots of factors that go into whether or not a business is going to increase uh, and grow over whatever period of time that you want to measure. Well, if that's the case then, what role does compensation have? And in this particular instance, what role did the phantom stock plan play? Well, let's think about that. What the phantom stock plan did in the scenario I gave, and, and I could pick any number of, of real life case studies to talk to you about where, where that kind of phenomenon really did occur. What it did was it provided within that organization a definition of what it means to create value for the business. So they did that by tying a certain benefit that key producers in that business were going to achieve as a result of that value being created, it being tied to the value increase in the business. It also established how value would be shared. It would be shared in the form of, fat, of phantom stock shares that could be exchanged at some point in the future for, for a cash payout. Further, it defined a financial partnership with the key producers, so they knew where they stood with that organization. They knew what their role was. They knew what what their their participation level was 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 going to be in the value they helped create in the business. As a result of having that kind of arrangement in place, it put them in the position then to attract and retain a certain kind of talent, people that are interested in driving results. So they would be, would be in a position to attract even premier talent with this kind of approach because they're going to get people that relate to the concept that if I create value, I participate in the value that I help create. Then ultimately it provided a channel for fulfilling what the, what the company felt was its compensation philosophy. We're going to talk quite a bit about compensation philosophy in just a few minutes, but in this particular organization, Compensation philosophy was that we share value with those that help create it, both short-term and long-term. So when you start looking at this combination of factors, you start seeing when you get the right people focused on the right issues and they have a sense of, of, of a financial partnership in the future of that business, they're compelled differently by that future. When people are compelled differently, their focus level is different, therefore their execution level is different. So these factors start having subtle nuances to them that impact the way that compensation ultimately ties to whether or not a company is having success either departmentally or company-wide uh, in revenue production, uh, in profit margins, or wh whatever the case might be. So if those were the really the wrong questions we asked earlier, um, then what are the right questions to ask? Well, the right question really then is, uh, the core right question is, well, what's the role of a compensation plan? If it's not just directly tied to the production of a, a value increase or, or a, a growth factor in the business, what is its role then? And then how do you determine whether or not it's fulfilling that role? And how do you ensure, it, ensure that it's successful in that role that it's assigned to? And that's what we're going to try to dig into today. So at the end of this, you understand what the proper role is and how to evaluate compensation. Well, what we found is the key to success in, in any compensation uh, planning is to make sure that we start out with the right structure. So we want to orient you, first of all, and what we mean by what it means to form a total compensation structure within a business and why that has value. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to have a total compensation structure, what types of different, different types of compensation structures there are, what the benefits are of, the, of having a, a compensation structure, then, then actually how do you think about going about constructing one? 
Now, my associate Tom Miller or uh, Joe Miller has had a lot of experience with building these kinds of structures inside real businesses, uh, several which he's for which he's had that role throughout the country. And so we've invited him today to share the benefit of his experience and, and how we might think about these issues. So Joe, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Ken. Many times when people are thinking about implementing a compensation structure, or even prior to that, assessing whether or not their compensation programs are any good, they start asking questions like the question Ken asked earlier. Now, is my bonus plan any good? Is my salary management any good? And really, that's not, that shouldn't be the starting point for assessing the effectiveness of your compensation programs. It really does, believe it or not, begin with your business model, assessing how the company makes money and how you're going to create and maintain your competitive advantage. Once you understand how cash flows through the business um, and, and really have made a determination on how the, the business operates, you can start to formulate a, a philosophy on pay. And a compensation philosophy is usually a key missing component in really assessing the effectiveness of your compensation programs. Your compensation philosophy really asks, answers the questions, you know, why do you want to pay your employees? What do you pay for? How much do you want to pay? Um, and really links to that, that business model so that you can say, great, I know how the business operates and I know as a consequence how and what and how much and to who I'll be paying my employees. With that philosophy in mind, you're able to start organizing your pay programs into what we call a total compensation structure. And a total compensation structure links what's happening in the marketplace with pay to your philosophy. So that you can say, hey, I know that my organization, we may pay a little bit lower in salaries, but we offset that with a really generous bonus or a phantom stock plan so that your pay is unique and customized to your organization. Once your compensation structure is in place, then you can begin managing the individual rewards elements inside of your plan, whether that's salaries or bonuses, long-term incentives, your executive benefits, your retirement benefits, your general benefits, whatever they may be, they should all be aligned inside of that compensation structure to your key compensation philosophy. And finally, there are three controls that you should be constantly monitoring. Number one, your operational integrity, which is our pay decisions that are currently being made aligned with our compensation philosophy. Your financial stewardship, how much are you investing in your, in your compensation programs? Um, are, there, are your plans forecasting against budget, for example? How are the numbers jiving with that philosophy? And finally, your partnership reinforcement, which is ultimately how you're communicating the value proposition of your compensation structure and how well do your employees understand the value offering within your compensation programs. So let's talk for a second about a compensation philosophy. We recommend that organizations take the time and sit down and actually draft a compensation philosophy statement, a written document that can be shared with their employees as well as with future employees, someone you're thinking about hiring, so that you could actually hand them a document and say, this is what we pay for. This is how much we pay. This is really our rewards value proposition. And ultimately, inside of that document, you'll be able to convey a sense of how much you're willing to pay for, each, for your positions um, relative to certain benchmarks, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. It's key, it's critical that you establish a balance between your guaranteed or your salary pay and your incentive pay. What is that right mix for you? Not necessarily what's, what's happening in the marketplace, but what's right for your organization. And make sure that your employees understand that there is a link to, to the overall company performance with their actual earnings or their incentive payouts. So let's talk about this sample compensation philosophy as I'm going to kind of walk you through the establishment of a compensation structure. Let's just assume that there's an organization that has made the determination that they want to pay at market or at the midpoint of the market, we'll say between the 40 and 50th percentile 
of pay for their salaries. And the reason they feel comfortable paying maybe even a little bit less than what's happening at the midpoint of the market because they have a pretty generous value sharing proposition with their incentive programs. The pay for the fit philosophy statement also makes sure that employees um, understand that there is a pay for performance mentality. And ultimately, their incentive pay is split 50-50 between their short-term incentives and long-term incentive opportunities. Once you have that philosophy statement, the next step is really to go to the marketplace. And so most organizations either purchase salary surveys or they hire outside firms to benchmark their, the pay of their positions against what's happening in the marketplace. Now remember, we talked for a second about having a unique compensation philosophy that targets pay somewhere within a range. And the salary surveys provide the, that range information. And normally we look, when we were doing this type of work, we look within major house surveys. Uh, well, what I mean by that are surveys that are published by major consulting firms like Towers Watson or Mercer. There's also industry-specific surveys within, uh, uh, within the market as well that you're usually able to purchase, as well as some data that's available on the internet. And we recommend taking a look at a combination of these sources and not relying exclusively on one or two sources, but trying to get as much intelligence as you can as you will notice that there can be a degree of variance between survey to survey. But ultimately, when you get that data, to organize it, at the very bottom of the slide, you'll see a sample market pay assessment that takes a look at an entry-level accountant. And with that accountant, that position, we've, we've taken a look within, I don't know, nine or ten salary surveys and found adequate matches within those surveys. We've aggregated that, added premium or discounted some of the data that we didn't think was very good or may have been really too good <laughs> for our match. We've weighted those surveys. And then we've compared the average survey of our accountant to that market data point. Now surveys, there's surveys out there that, that, that focus exclusively on salaries, but there's other surveys that provide you intel on incentive pay, on both bonuses and long-term incentives. There's information on benefits. There's information on uh, retirement uh, benefits as well. And so knowing where to go, where to purchase those surveys, to kind of give you an indication of what's happening in the market is really the next step here. Joe, this is Ken, and, and for the audience's sake, this is, uh, by the way, one of the values of chief, chief executives, uh, executive uh, survey, compensation survey that they do and the kind of data they have. This is the sort of thing you want to do with that data and compare it with other data as well. But they're one of the uh, few companies that really has surveyed private companies exclusively for the data that they use as well. So this is one of the potential applications of that data for those of you that have acquired that data already. And ideally, that, that's, that's great, Ken. That's, that's perfect because you want to try and get data that's as specific as possible to either your industry, to your geography, to the size of your organization, to really trying to scope it and narrow down uh, the, the, the match information to be as specific and particular to your business as possible. Okay, so now that we have a compensation philosophy, we have market data, there's really going to be an intersection of those two data points. And that's really where you begin your, your structure. Okay, So what we decided that we needed to do if we were going to follow our compensation philosophy is to create or align our salary ranges to that market percentile that we selected. And let's assume that we want to redefine our bonus targets against the market intelligence we got as well. We know we need to develop a long-term incentive plan. And we determined that based on the market data, we were able to acquire that our benefits, our retirement package, is within the scope of, of what we've defined in our compensation philosophy. So no changes there. So off to building a structure. Uh, most organizations start uh, with, a, with, with predefined salary ranges. Um, most, most organizations don't necessarily want to build a structure around starting with, I should say, with, say, the retirement benefits or even their incentives because everybody participates typically within your salary program. It's the key place to start. And there are really four specific types of salary ranges that organizations develop. And we'll, we'll, we'll give you a brief example and talk about all four 
uh, in the next couple of slides here. The first is what I refer to as a pure market pricing approach. And that's where we take a look at the market intelligence for each of our positions. We, we uh, establish those ranges based on the market data. And then ultimately, based on our philosophy, we can determine, hey, do we want to pay at the median, at the 75th percentile, 25th percentile? And these types of structures are ideal for organizations where the positions are very, very common. They're easy to find in the marketplace like an accounting organization, for example. Um, the, the downside is if you get too large, programs like this become administratively difficult to manage, meaning if you have 50 or 60 unique positions or even 30 or 40 unique positions, it becomes burdensome every year to go to the market to reprice your positions and then establish new ranges year over year based on that market intelligence. These are still used. They're very common. Um, but depending on the size, the scope of your organization may not be ideal. The next type of structure that people still use are what I refer to as traditional salary ranges. And these are still very, very common within very large organizations. And these ranges are, these ranges are built using market intelligence. And ultimately, using that intelligence, positions are lumped together that have similar levels of pay, and those ranges are, uh, excuse me, those positions eventually establish salary ranges. So if I took my accountant level one, I took an administrative assistant level one, I took a financial analyst level one, I took all these positions that were determined to have similar market equity, I lump them together and take a look at that data, I can create a range for them with a minimum, a midpoint, and a maximum. Now these ranges stack one on top of another um, so that there is hierarchy, and ultimately positions are promoted from one grade to the next. Uh, you'll still see structures like this, um, which are very common inside of, uh, say, uh, GE, for example, or within the uh, U.S. government, have very, very particular ranges. And you'll notice there's not a whole lot of overlap. You kind of need to work your way from the minimum of that range up to the maximum until you're promoted up to the next level. And so to really have an effective traditional salary structure, you need to have a lot of employees, a lot of positions. The next type of structure is what we call broadband structure. And broadband structuring became very, very common in the 80s and even had a resurgence in the dot-com boom of the mid to late 90s, where positions were market priced, but they were kind of generally banded together with a lot of positions that had very, very wide ranges. Um, and positions were grouped together usually on the type of role they were. And so in this example, you can see that we have an entry-level band. So if you started the organization, regardless of your position, you would be inside this salary band with usually a very, very wide gap between the minimum salary and the maximum salary. And eventually you might be promoted up to that next band, that professional-level band. Um, and you'll notice that there's, there's a wide degree of overlap between that entry-level band and the professional-level band. And ultimately, all benefits and perquisites, bonus targets, for example, would be, would be correlated to these bands. Um, and this became very, very um, common because it was very easy to administer. The downside is that it's not very, very specific to the market. So once you're hiring that entry-level accountant, knowing that you have a very, very wide range may be comforting to you as a manager, but knowing really what is the starting point for that salary may be very, very confusing to you at the same time. What we're seeing more and more of today are really what I refer to as hybrid reward structures. And a hybrid reward structure is really a combination of the last two salary structure types. It takes the best part of broadbanding it takes the best part of the traditional structure and melds them together. And so you'll notice there, there are ranges stacked on top of each other, um, just like the traditional structure. But in a hybrid structure, you stretch out those ranges quite a bit, and you allow a high degree of overlap, like you see in a broadband structure. And this supports career progression. People move up from, from band to band. But it also provides you with the flexibility needed to pay people at a very low end of the range or at the very, very high end of the range. And these are becoming more and more common in the marketplace. Uh, most organizations now 
have kind of shied away for the most part from the broadband or the traditional structure types to something like this because it provides market accuracy, being that it's very well correlated to the market intelligence, the salary survey data, but it also provides you with flexibility, the ability to pay above or beneath what's, what's, what's uh, indicated in the market data at the same time. So once salary ranges have been established, the next step is to try to go through the same process for your bonus plan, your long-term incentives, for all your rewards offerings to lay out a total compensation structure. And in the total compensation structure you see here, it clearly delineates how much the company is willing to pay at each level of the structure. So within the, uh, the left-hand column, you can see the grade or the band that's been set up. Each grader band has a salary range. The grade may have a bonus target, may, have, may be eligible for long-term incentives with their targets established, 401k, deferred compensation, employee benefits, uh, executive benefits, all laid out nice and evenly so that when an employee is promoted to the next level, there's not a big discussion or question as to what the organization is willing to pay. It's all been codified. A compensation structure also helps you to establish how much you're spending for each of these rewards programs, as well as budgeting for future expenses. Finally, once you've established that structure, you now have a tool for measuring how effective your pay program is. And ultimately, the, the key here is the, what I mentioned on the first slide, are the controls that should be in place. So on a regular basis, you should be asking yourself, do we have operational integrity? In other words, are we managing pay according to our compensation philosophy? You should be controlling your financial stewardship, evaluating whether or not you're overspending on your salaries against your compensation philosophy and that market data. And finally, ensuring that you have effective communications in your partnership reinforcement so that people understand what you're willing to pay for, how much you're going to pay and for what type of performance. And by following this type of system on an annual or a regular basis, taking a look at your structure and saying, hey, we, we, we can check these three boxes off. We do have the operational integrity. We do have financial stewardship and we do believe in partnership reinforcement. Allows you to say, hey, we're paying in accordance, not only with our compensation philosophy, but what's happening in the marketplace as well. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that overview. So let's talk about what we've said so far. We've said that um, in order to evaluate whether or not we are having success with our compensation strategy, the first starting point really isn't even with our compensation plans at all. It's saying, well, what is our business model and our strategy? How does that relate to our vision and where we're going as a business? And our, our business model is how we produce revenue in the marketplace. Our business strategy is how we're going to compete in the marketplace. And so we want to make sure then that once we have that clearly defined, we have a compensation philosophy that reinforces that model, that strategy, and that vision so that there's complete alignment. We don't want people walking into a meeting where we talk about where the business is going, the kind of growth that we want to have, and how we need people everybody pulling together on the oars to, to help us achieve that growth. But then when people get paid, it tugs them in a completely different direction. And we see this all the time. So going back to my initial uh, couple of slides there, we talked about, well, if we install a, 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 install a fan of stock program, is that what, what, the, what, what, what makes the company grow or double in revenue over the next three or four years? Well, the answer is kind of yes and no. Uh, it, has to, it has to do with whether or not that phantom stock plan was, in fact, fulfilling its proper role in this context we just talked about. And once we have worked that way all the way through, through our philosophy, then understanding then what our compensation structure needs to be to support that philosophy, now we have a tool for evaluation of what we're doing. So let's use this graphic and work kind of backwards here. We have a company that wants to grow. It, it sees in the future something bigger than it is right now. It recognizes to do that, it really has to become what we refer to as a wealth, wealth multiplier organization, that everybody that's a stakeholder sees the ability to uh, 
participate in that growth that they help create. Well, if that growth is going to occur, we're going to need what we refer to as a culture of confidence, where people um, uh, really have a kind of certainty about where the business is going and what their role is in it and how they're supposed to perform in that role. When you have that kind of culture of confidence and it permeates everywhere, you, st you are seeing sustained results. That where th that's where that culture of confidence comes from. People are seeing um, what good to great refer to as that flywheel effect uh, that's taking shape. And so if things start happening more regularly, success starts happening more regularly, and sustained results uh, uh, are being produced, therefore this culture of confidence emerges. Well, those same sustained results come because people are, are executing correctly on the right things on a consistent basis. Execution is a function of focus. When people know what they're supposed to focus on and they learn how to focus on the right issues, they're able to execute properly. So one of the things that we want to do then in, in creating this focus here is using compensation as a strategic tool to do that. So we build a compensation game plan. That game plan has two parts to it. One is the structure that Joe's been talking about. The other is paying attention to all of the mindset issues. Are we achieving engagement from our people? Are we seeing the sense of commitment that we feel? Do people have a sense of partnership in our organization? Is this, are we building this culture of confidence that we're talking about? So structure becomes one part of that. The mindset becomes kind of the art part of the compensation design. It's constantly measuring as we look at our bonus plans and as we look at long-term incentive plans or value sharing plans, yes, we want to know what market pay data says, but we also want to have a sense for, is this the right thing? Is this meaningful to people? Is it going to make a difference to them in terms of their sense of partnership? Is it going to help us attract and retain the right kind of people? So for us to achieve that, what we have to really do, be able to do then is now, within that structure, start breaking out the pieces and saying, okay, well, what are the pieces that should be part of our structure, and how much weight should each be given? So you'll see here a pie uh, where we have on, on the right side of the pie kind of pure compensation elements, and on the left side of the pie kind of the benefit sorts of plans that companies might consider putting in place. So we look at these, these eight elements here, everything from salary through sales incentives, performance incentives, which are incentives that will be uh, paid for performance that's, that, that's achieved in, in a 12-month period or less, uh, growth incentives that are for periods of performance of 12 months or more. And we start evaluating um, which of those are going to be a priority for us. Well, what's going to be the basis of that evaluation? Well, we're going to make an allocation of a significant amount of our, our capital that's going to be deployed to our compensation, invested in compensation, based on certain key outcomes that we need to achieve. If we know what those outcomes are, we can start linking, well, what are the compensation elements that are most likely to create the right focus to produce that kind of outcome? And those outcomes, of course, are driven by the growth goals of the organization. So we're always giving context to whatever we do. What the, set, what the compensation structure allows us to do is always keep these things in balance, okay? If we're going to increase over here in our performance incentives, what are we doing? What, what salary grade are we doing that for? And where are these people already in that salary? And are we getting out of whack? Are we getting out of balance in what we're doing there? Now, when we go to work for a company, this is a, a typical allocation that we'll see. Uh, heavy emphasis on salary. Most companies have some kind of short-term incentive, like an annual bonus plan. They have a retirement plan. They have some insurance in force. I would suspect if we surveyed those on the webinar today that many of you have a right now a compensation structure that kind of has these elements to it. And probably on the short-term bonus side, you probably struggle with that from, from time to time. There's usually a lot of pain surrounding this. We see everything from people that have a completely discretionary incentive plan where the basically the owner goes into the closet at the end of the year, looks at his profits and says, okay, these are kind of my key people. I see how they contributed. This is kind of what I'm going to ferret out to each of those uh, people. And then they ultimately um, come away a year or two later finding out that they've just established an, an entitlement program and people are just expecting this to be paid out every year 
as your annual Christmas bonus. Very often that's when our, our phone rings. So what we want to think in terms of instead is kind of a scale that looks like this. We have these two axes on our graph that we're going to look at. We want to think about what's the balance we want to have between on variable compensa compensation between real really low or guaranteed compensation versus very high at-risk compensation. And then we'll, what's the right balance between short-term and long-term? Where do we want to be with that? So when we look at this and we try, try to identify what we call kind of ideal compensation allocations, right here is what we often see um, most often in, in organizations we, we do work for. Very low on the variability scale and much of it's guaranteed. And, and much of it's way too short term. There's no long term horizon. The other end, you might see um, startups that look something like this. High variability, um, lots of long term, maybe too much long term, not enough guaranteed up front. So where's the right balance? Well, right, maybe right here. It really depends a little bit on different factors, does it? Because not every organization is at the same level of development. So when we look at compensation positioning, it's hard to generalize about where somebody should be kind of on these scales and the fixed uh, versus at risk and short term versus long term. If you want to look at what we call kind of a model company mix, most private companies we find are right here, um, somewhere in this range right here on this in this uh, lower left hand quadrant. Startups are up here on the upper right-hand quadrant where it's a, a lot of long-term compensation, much of it at risk. People that are in growth mode are kind of over here, uh, still in this upper right-hand quadrant because they're trying to drive growth and have people focused on it. People that are more of that harvest stage kind of gravitate back over here. So many of these private companies need to evaluate, well, where are we? And, and many of them need to move more to this side of the scale and up a little bit. That's the, the primary thing we see missing. And primarily that's why very often we find that they're ineffective, that they're, they're finding themselves ineffective in their pay programs and evaluate them that way because they don't feel like they're getting the bang for the buck that they want. So it becomes not so much a matter of how much they're paying. They may be paying just the right amount. The question really is, how they're paying, what form of compensation are they paying out, and how is that being um, fettered out. So um, mirroring what we do with our compensation structure then, we have to establish and build compensation in this evaluation I just described inside of what we refer to as a performance framework. So this is an expansion on something that uh, Joe referred to earlier. The performance framework is really made up of three three elements, a business framework, a compensation framework, and a talent framework. The business, business framework basically says what we said earlier. Let's define what our growth expectations are, where's our business going, what's the key end outcomes we need to achieve. Let's define what our business model is, what our performance engine is, how the company is going to compete in the marketplace, where our growth opportunities are. But let's identify now what the roles and expectations are that we have in that. Start establishing performance criteria. Let's really define what success really means and what value creation really means inside our business framework. When we have that framework in mind, we can also then look at our compensation framework. This is where we talk about the pay philosophy that Joe referred to earlier. This is where we start engineering a pay strategy that includes both the structure he talked about and the mindset issues I referred to. But we also have to rec recognize in doing this that we don't place, place, uh, place too high of an expectation on, uh, on compensation. That is part of a total rewards approach that really has four elements to it. And those four elements are these. When, when somebody comes into a business or they're, um, or they're at a business already, they're const constantly evaluating these four issues. Number one. Am I compelled by the future of this business? Not only do I, I like where the company is going, but do I see myself in that future and do I see that my unique abilities are needed to achieve it? Number two, is there a positive work environment here? Do I like the nature of the work I'm doing, the people I'm working with, the culture? Do I share the values of the culture? Am I able to get problems solved? Am I working within the realm of my unique abilities as there open ch communication channels, et cetera? Number three, opportunities for personal professional growth. 
I have a unique ability. Am I going to get better at what I do because I'm associated with this organization? This might mean training, but it goes really beyond training. It's not just career advancement either. It's a matter of people evaluating the resources of a business and saying, look, I, I get personal fulfillment out of the work that I do, and I want to make sure that that's going to be enhanced as a result of the relationship I have with this business. Then finally, financial rewards. And financial rewards is just as important component as the rest of them, but it's only one of four. If any, any of these elements goes too far south, somebody will leave the organization or they won't join in the first place. If you examine most of the people that left your business in the last uh, year or two, I bet you'll find that they the, the reason for them leave, leaving fell in one or more of these quadrants here. So let's make sure that we put financial rewards in the right context so that we know what it is we're trying to, uh, uh, what expectations to have of, of, our, of our compensation programs as we put them in place. The last framework then is our talent framework. And this is where we're going to line up these other things that we've just been talking about in our performance framework with where our talent lies right now. So we're going to identify who our key producers are in the business. Um, and, and, and those are the key producers are whom? They're the ones that are meeting the success standards, and they're doing so consistently. We're going to identify where we have gaps in talent. This is going to inform our recruiting strategy. Then we're going to communicate expectations, and here's again where comp comes back into, uh, into play. Now we're going to communicate rewards in that context, where people are going to understand what our philosophy is, what the specific programs are they will participate in that reflects that philosophy, and we're going to give them a value statement that shows them uh, a projection of what, what all of those values are going to be over time. So a proper view of compensation then is what? It's, it's one where we see it as a strategic tool. We understand that it's not one-dimensional. It's going to be multifaceted. We have to define what, what its role is going to be, and it, that's going to be given context by the outcomes we're looking for. And we have to define the kind of financial partnership that we want to have with people. And then we want it to uh, communicate to people what's important to the organization and what priorities they should have. That's part of compensation's role and the tool that it should be. So when we do that properly, we come away with something that looks like this as we're evaluating and building our compensation structure. We look at each plan that we're implementing or thinking about implementing. We, we define what our purpose is that we're trying to achieve with each of those plans. We set what the standard of measurement it is going to be for each of those forms of pay. What our investment or our commitment or our budget is going to be for each of those. And then how we're going to measure our return on that investment. And we're going to have specific ways that we're going to go about evaluating that. Sorry, trying to get my cursor to move in the right spot here. So one of the things in that context that we want to be able to do is we talk about measuring our return on total co compensation investment is to know how we really uh, evaluate whether or not we're getting a return on the investment that we're making in pay. Compensation is probably the biggest deployment of capital that your business makes every year. Other things that you do in the business, you probably measure what return you're getting on it and have mechanisms for doing that. Seldom do we see businesses with mechanisms for evaluating their return on their compensation investment. So let's think about how you might want to consider doing that. So I want you to think for just a minute now, right now in your business, what your total rewards commitment is. Now don't leave the room right now to try to gather this data. Just get a ballpark figure in your mind that adds up all of these things that you're seeing on the screen right now. Now here's the question for you. What return do you get on that investment? That's probably a pretty large number. Uh, the meaning that the, the, the sum of those things is probably a pretty large number. So not knowing what kind of return you're getting on it should give you pause because like anything else that you're investing in, we want to make sure that we're getting an appropriate return and we can only do that if we measure that. Well, let's think about if you don't know that percentage, how you might think about evaluating that in the future. So let's go through a sample calculation right now. Let's say that you have a capital account in your business of $20 million. And you can scale this up or down depending on the size of your business. So 
your stock, your debt, and other things that go into your capital account. Well, one of the first things that we want to think about then is something we refer to as a cost or charge to that capital. That cost of capital we're going to assign here is 12%. We've seen anything from 8 to 15%, even 20% sometimes. But essentially what we're saying is, okay, with the capital at work already in the business, shareholders have an expectation of what it's costing them to keep that capital in the business. Because if it's not going to be in the business and generate a return, what's it in the business for? I'm going to pull it out and put it someplace else. So we're going to have a capital charge in our example here of $2.4 million. Or another way of thinking about this is we're going to say the first $2.4 million that we get in profit in the business, we're going to attribute to this capital that's already been at work in the business. Well, let's say that our total operating income for this um, sample year is $10 million. So what we wanted to come up with is something we refer to as what our productivity profit is. So if we're assigning $2.4 million of profit to the capital already at work in the business, then the difference between this $10 million and this $2.4 million has to be attributable to what? Well, it has to be attributable to our people, right? So we're going to say our productivity profit is $7.6 million in this particular business. Or another way of thinking about that is we're saying that we can account for the fact that our people produce $7.6 million of profit. Our capital, other capital work, produced $2.4 million. Well, now that we have that in mind, let's look at what our total rewards investment was. Let's say in the example that, that I gave on a, on a previous slide, that when you that added that up, that came to $25 million. Again, scale it up or down depending on the size of your business. So one of the things that we want to start establishing then is a ratio here. Okay, here's our productivity profit. Here's what we're paying in our total rewards. So what's that ratio? Here we have a, a, a rotary calculation, a rotary ratio, if you will. Rotary, again, is the return on total rewards investment of 30.4%. When we do this calculation for a business or with a business, one of the first things they say is, well, is that good? Is that a good number? We say, well, it's neither good nor bad. It just is. I mean, it's going to be a different number for every business depending on margins and uh, capital accounts and charge of capital and all those kind of factors. The question is, what happens to this figure over time? Because if you want to start evaluating the effectiveness of your compensation programs, this is something you want to start measuring. Are we seeing improvement in our road tree over time? Because that tells us that this allocation of our total rewards investment is producing something. Our productivity profit is improving. And the productivity profit then becomes the, the means by which all variable pay plans are financed. Every variable pay plan, every incentive plan you have in your organization should be self-financed. It should come out of productivity profit. And if it's not, then you really do have to evaluate whether or not it's being effective at what it's doing. So this is the rotary calculation, an important one we think that companies should do. Now, once you have that rotary calculation, then we have to go now back to that other kind of what I refer to as kind of the art part of compensation design, and that is, okay, are we meeting now the mindset issues of our employees and keeping them properly engaged uh, and focused and committed to what they're doing? So we want to pay attention to what we refer to as kind of the employee hierarchy of needs. As they look at their pay, what are they evaluating? Well, first of all, they're evaluating cash flow and living standards. By, despite what market pay tells me, I have a sense of, based on my skill level and my station in life, what I am should be eligible for. So that has to be met with my kind of, I have to be able to meet my cash flow and standard of living requirements in that regard. Risk protection. Uh, I see the business as one of the mechanisms I have to protect myself from financial risk. That's why I want to know if you if you've got a good health plan, if you've if you've got things in place to help me uh, manage things so that if my son goes down on a, a Saturday afternoon during a Pop Warner football game, that you know, when I go to the hospital, I'm not going to be now you know financially decimated because of what I have to pay out there. I also see it as a mechanism for me to accumulate money for retirement and making sure that I have at least an adequate means of doing that. 
And finally, I want to make sure that there is a mechanism in place to share in the value that I help create. So if I'm putting my work, unique abilities at work here, then I want to make sure that as I create something, there's a sense of partnership about how that will be uh, given to me. Then I look at all of these things and I say what I'm really trying to do here is see the, the organization I work with as a means of my accumulating the wealth that I, I feel that I would like to be able to accumulate and there's mechanisms in that business for doing that. So we match this up to compensation. The, the cash flow and standard of living requirements are going to be met obviously through our kind of salary and bonus arrangements. Here in our risk protection, we want to make sure we have comprehensive and flexible benefits plan. Our retirement plan is going to be through our, our qualified plans such as 401k or, or profit sharing plans that we might do. We might supplement with executive kinds of retirement plans such as deferred compensation or CERT plans. Value sharing then comes, this is where our short and long term incentive plans come in and making sure that we have mechanisms in place that protect shareholders. We're paying things out of productivity profit, but there is a way to acknowledge the productivity in a fair way for those that help produce it. So this wealth accumulation standard then is met when a company really kind of develops this wealth multiplier philosophy. We see that as we make an appropriate and measured and monitored investment in our people that we're going to melt, 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 multiply wealth for everybody in the business. Uh, not just ownership, but, but our key people and others that are working in our business as well. And all of this has to be based on a clear pay philosophy that guides where we want to be with each of these people, what kind of talent we're trying to attract, and what expectations we're going to have in this regard. Because what we want to have happening when, when this employee down here comes to work every day, we want him or her to have something we call line of sight. So if we need sales growth, we need margin improvement, we have to be able to, him to have him break that down into other things he's thinking about. Product improvements, cost improvements, customer satisfaction, productivity improvements, uh, employee retention issues, and so on and so forth. So this person needs to be able to see what his or her job responsibilities are, how they impact these things, and how these in these issues impact the overall um, outcomes that the company is looking for towards its growth objectives. And so these things now have to be translated back to how value was created and that employee has to be able to see that when I do these things I see how I participate in that value I've helped create it. This is what we call creating line of sight in a business. And when you create line of sight in a business, you start getting more of that focus that we talked about earlier. When you get that focus, you start getting greater execution. When execution happens consistently, then you get patterns of success. When you have patterns of success that continue over time, you build a culture of confidence. And when you have a culture of confidence, you build a wealth multiplier organization. So this is how we get then from those re rewards to results. When we create those rewards, we are creating that level of focus I talked about, we get focus, we get execution. When we get execution, we get results. So to summarize then, how do we make uh, an assessment as to whether or not a compensation strategy is successful? Well, the measure should be whether or not it's fulfilling our role. And we just helped you hopefully see how you identify the proper role for each piece of your compensation, how you build a structure in which to evaluate that, and the core philosophy that should drive it. But let's just break it down one more time as we close here. So key questions should, that should be asked, first of all, in value creation. Before designing the plan, did the company clearly define value creation? Does the plan include metrics that are consistent now with that definition of value creation? and that road tree calculation that gave you one example about how you do that. Does value sharing occur out of productivity profit? If these things are occurring, then that means the plan is only paying value out of value that has been created, self-financed. This also suggests that during periods of economic decline or stagnation, the plan is self-restricting in its payouts because it's only going to be paying it money out if it reaches certain thresholds. So this should be considered a successful approach. It's properly fulfilling its role. What about the philosophy of the organization? Is there a clear philosophy statement? Is it communicated effectively? Are the compensation strategies consistent with that? 
Well, if that's being answered affirmatively, then also the company is being clear about what it's paying for, what it's willing to pay for, and it's implementing plans that follow that rule. And if it's consistently doing that, that's a successful approach. What about market pay? Does the company compare its pay strategies to market standards? Does the philosophy statement define where the company wants to be vis-a-vis -vis market pay? Is there kind of an internal equity analysis performed to make sure that what we're doing uh, with market pay doesn't just base it on market pay, but what our internal standards need to be as well? Well, if we're doing this, then we're, we're using some outside metrics to help determine if we're over or underpaying for a certain function. It also um, likewise offers, um, if we're also offering significant upside potential in addition to what we're doing with guaranteed pay, we're reflecting that in our total pro value proposition. So if we know that we have taken this approach, then we know that we're competitive and we can even put ourselves in a position of, of obtaining the competitive advantage of the marketplace. So this, again, is a successful approach. And finally, on the total rewards um, uh, uh, idea, does the company market a future to its people? Is there a clear and compelling vision in place? Is there a positive work in, uh, environment? Are there opportunities for personal and professional development? Is the financial partnership clearly defined with the people? Well, if you're taking a total rewards approach and you're adopting this methodology in the way you're evaluating things, then you have a successful uh, compensation program in place. And you can evaluate the total re re rewards approach as a successful one because it takes into account all of the elements that should be considered as to what's going to drive the performance of your people. Well, with that, if you would type in your, your questions now, in just a moment here, we're going to start fielding those questions. Uh, those of you that um, are going to stay on for those, we appreciate that. If you're going to jump off, recognize just a couple things before you go. Um, we appreciate your time today, and, and, and as, a, as a token of our appreciation, we want to offer to you an opportunity to meet with one of our principals at no charge. We'd be happy to set up a consultation just uh, no, under no obligation just to talk about issues that you're, you know, you would like to, to talk about. There'll be a survey that pops up when you when you close out of this meeting that gives help, helpful feedback to chief executive and to us about uh, the information you got today, but that's also where you would indicate interest in that final survey. Also, we, uh, separate from this one that we're doing today, do other online seminars like the one you're experiencing. If you'd like to attend the next one we have, just go to our website at VailAdvisors.com for more information. The next one will be next Tuesday, the 20th. We'll be talking about the eight fatal compensation mistakes, uh, basically giving you the benefit of our, of our observations of years and years and working with hundreds of companies and, and the consistent mistakes we see them make and how they can be avoided. We have a couple of websites that we operate if you want more information about us or about some of the topics that you've heard discussed today. There's articles here, there's webinars recorded here, um, lots of a blog and lots of good information to turn to to, uh, to get more information. For those specifically interested in things such as phantom stock and other kinds of long-term standard plans, we did, we did build a website that's dedicated just to those issues, so visit phantom stock online if you'd like further information about those. Um, we have a white paper that you can have a access to, again, on the final survey. We, we've got several of these. Our most recent one's entitled The Total Compensation Structure. It talks a lot about the issues that we talked about today, so express your interest for that on that survey. We'll be happy to get that out to you as well. And if you want to follow us on any social media, if that's your preference, we're, we're on virtually all of them, so you can look for information there as well. So we want to thank you for attending, and, that, and again, just before we turn the time back to Michael to field any questions you might have, uh, please complete that survey as you log out. That gives us valuable input. It's also you, you can request a copy of today's slides, get the, request the white paper there for that consultation that we, we, we spoke of. So Michael, let me turn it back to you for any questions that, uh, that we may have. Yeah, thank you so much, Ken and Joe. So we're right up against the end of our webinar blocks. We'll just have time for a couple of quick questions. 
so the first one, uh, can you please provide some trusted resources for determining market pricing on various positions? So, of course, Chief Executive, we have our uh, CEO and Senior Executive Compensation Report for private companies. I recommend you check out. But, uh, Ken, could you maybe mention some other sources that could be of value? Sure. In fact, I'll actually turn that over to Joe. Joe, why don't you comment on that? Yeah, I mentioned earlier that there's three types of sources. If you're looking for just general benchmark information, uh, the big consulting firms, Towers Watson, Mercer, Radford, uh, they provide data. It is very pricey. Um, like I mentioned earlier, for that reason, a lot of times people go outside to try and get a third party to provide that information to them. If you're looking for anything that's more specific to industries, I recommend uh, contacting any industry, industry associations that you may uh, participate in, as a lot of them do have very, very valuable market intel. Great, thank you. So we'll just take one more Thanks, final Michael. question. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the last one: What is your definition of capital count, capital account, and what is included in that? Well, it's defined uh, a little bit differently for every organization. It's going to certainly include stock and debt that you have, other capital acquisitions that, and assets that the company might have. Those are going to be the primary elements. Some people include other things in there as well, but that's those are the primary ones. Okay, great. So we're going to end the Q&A there. Uh, other questions that we weren't able to get to, we'll answer them over email. And if you have additional questions, please enter those in the survey that's going to pop up when you leave the webinar. I want to thank uh, Ken Gibson and Joe Miller again for the great presentation. And thank you all for attending. We will uh, send you the slides as well as a recording of this webinar within the next couple of days that you can share uh, and reference yourself. And we'll also be having another webinar on compensation with the Vision Link Advisory Group in the next couple of months, and we will keep you posted on that. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our speakers, and we hope to see you at another Chief Executive Online event soon. Thanks, everybody.